Now, here, here's the question to be answered. I mean, you know who that is on the right there of your screen? That's me, 20 years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. Who's that other man? Well, I guess we all know him too. In fact, uh, let's look at something that uh, he's used to being part of, or at least he was. My friend Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken fame. All right, you can come back to me. I feel like, you know, kind of doing this. Finger licking good. That's what it's going to be today in a very special Bible study coming up. It is an absolutely remarkable subject that we're going to deal with. I'd like us to put it on the screen at this time so that you can see exactly what that subject is going to be. And then a little later, I'll get into the subject. And I want you to get your Bible ready. I want you to get your uh, VCR there going so that you can record this. Because we're going to study in the Old Testament the living bird dipped in blood, the scapegoat, and the red heifer. Keep it for a second. Three different types and shadows of our Lord Jesus Christ to come. The living bird dipped in blood. Remember the living bird dipped in blood, the scapegoat, and the red heifer. That's going to be the subject today. You can come back to me. Now we talked about the good tasting chicken. Let's get into the meat of God's Word almost immediately and listen to this startling statement. I'm going to teach you today how to violate your conscience and how to get away with it and how to enjoy it. Now there's a little song that says, always let your conscience be your guide. But of course that is a bunch of garbage. And the reason is simple. This thing called the conscience can be trained, can be taught, can be cultured, so that it is framed in a certain way, and maybe not necessarily according to the Word of God. For example, I remember a dear Catholic friend in Ireland telling me about the occasion when they were invited to go to a Protestant church. And they said they knew that the very judgment of God would fall upon them if they put one foot over the door of a Protestant sanctuary. They said they could not violate their conscience, and therefore they could not go. That at least was their initial reaction. But surely that conscience was not in tune with the Spirit of God. It was reacting as it had been taught to react. No, it is not true. One more time, as the song says, always let your conscience be your guide. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of Christians who never get to enjoy the real blessing of God because their stupid conscience keeps them from living. If you sit under a condemnatory ministry, you will end up where you think it's almost a sin just to breathe. And you've got to be so holy and so righteous, and you really think it's God. And maybe it's not God at all. And maybe through this program you will find out how to have a sprinkled conscience, how to have a purged conscience, how to have one that's been liberated from all the wrong religious teaching that has gone into it inside your head since you first started to get taught with some religious teacher who messed you up. Now, you don't hear many people talking about this, but I want you to hear it today. You can be delivered from a conscience which you thought was of God and maybe is not of God at all. You remember just recently we had these suicide bombers in Israel, these young Arab men who attach bombs to them and get on a bus or go somewhere where there's a lot of people. They detonate it. Of course, a lot of people get killed. They themselves commit suicide. Why do they do it? Because they're taught it is the right thing to do. They're taught it is the godly thing to do. As a matter of fact, they're taught that by doing it, they're instantly catapulted into heaven, into the eternal presence of God, and they cannot violate their conscience. They just have to go out and kill a bunch of people. And I could go on, and I could go on, and I could go on. In fact, you know, there's some people think uh, you can't even purchase an ice cream on a Sunday. 
There's some people thinking, particularly in Ireland, you know, if the little children use the swings in the park on a Sunday, that there's something wrong with that also. In fact, we have people who, you know, would uh, die before they would, quote, violate the Lord's day or the Sabbath day. Of course, the Sabbath, if you want to be technical about it, is actually Saturday. As a matter of fact, when the Bible says to keep the Sabbath day, that is an Old Testament type and shadow which has, like all the other types and shadows, a spiritual significance. I'm not asking you to keep a particular day. In fact, Paul said that some people keep one day to the Lord and some keep another day. But he said, as for me, he said, I keep every day as unto God. You see, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us how to be at peace how to, as, the, as the, the, the Hebrew letter, as I've just said, says, he that has entered into peace has ceased from his own works, just as God ceased from works and he rested on the Sabbath day. Likewise with us, when we Sabbath, it means to Sabbath or Sabbathing, which is a spiritual thing, which has nothing to do with the keeping of a certain day. It has to do with entering into rest. That is ceasing from your own works as a means of trying to get peace with God. And yet there are people so hung up on a certain day, on a certain way, on certain dress, on certain things to do or say or not to do, and they go around spreading their bondage to other people, and they're very sincere because they feel they're going by their conscience, and they are going by their conscience, and they've allowed their conscience to be their guide. The problem is the conscience has been programmed by the culture and the teaching that they were raised in, which maybe has nothing to do with the Spirit of God, and in those instances, has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. Well, I never in my life, you may say, heard of anybody trying to teach me how to get set free from my conscience. Well, if you've had a kind of conscience like I've just talked about, you need to be set free from it. And you need to understand that God said, Jesus speaking, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And you're not supposed to be under bondage to a whole list of do do this and don't do that, where you get into such torturous bondage that you really have no joy of your salvation whatsoever. Did you get all that? So what we're going to talk about today really is deliverance from a wrongly influenced conscience, or how to have peace. And we're going to get into the meat of God's Word by studying three things in the Old Testament. They actually happened, but they were all types and shadows. What is a type and shadow? Well, the Bible says, Paul speaking, they were shadows of things to come. For instance, if you're standing there in the noonday sun and you cast a shadow, if anybody saw the shadow, they can soon trace it to the substance. So the things that happened in the Old Testament they, though they happened and have certain lessons in them, we have to trace them to the substance who is Christ to get the full answer. For example, when David slew Goliath, what are we supposed to learn from that? Are we to get a spiritual lesson? Or are we to read that and get excited and go out and get five rocks and then go hunting for tall people? Well, you know that's not the case at all. It's not a physical thing. It was a physical thing to give us a spiritual lesson. So in the Old Testament, God gives us three things to give us deliverance from sin, from guilt, and from death in the mind. And when they're all transferred to the New Testament and fulfilled in the substance of Christ, then it means we can have a sprinkled or a pure or a purged conscience so that we can start to enjoy God. Well, I thought my problem or the problem of most people was adultery or bad thoughts or, or gambling or going to CHPO, you know, all these things you hear about. Your biggest problem may be a twisted conscience because you were raised wrong religiously. The Apostle Paul puts it, in fact, Jesus says it too in the New Testament. You better hear this one, that the time will come that he that kills you, the person that goes out and destroys by death the true pure saints of God, he will kill you because he thinks that he does God's service. Now, that's the ultimate thing. 
And Paul was doing that himself. He was, you know, wanting to kill the saints or at least lock them up in jail because he knew he was fulfilling his conscience. He was doing what he had been taught to do. Problem is, he had been taught wrong and therefore had a programmed conscience which was a violation of God's Word because he mistook the bondage of a conscience for God's Word, whereas they are the exact opposite, not bondage, but liberty is what God's Word gives. And so we have three things to study. Adjust your thinking cap and learn. And I'll be reading you scriptures. I may or I may not actually let the camera zero in and show you some of these later on. But if not, at least I'll read them to you as we talk about the living bird dipped in blood, as we talk about the two goats, you remember, each day of atonement which came once a year, and of course the ashes off the red heifer or the teaching of the red heifer itself. If we've got that graphic, we can put it back up on the screen. The living bird dipped in blood. The Bible says there were two birds which were to be brought for the ceremony of the cleansing of the leper. But you must remember that the leprous man, though it was leprosy, it speaks today of us of the problem of sin. The living bird dipped in blood. Then the scapegoat. There were two goats also. One was sacrificed. One was led into the wilderness by a fit man and let go. Well, in that instance also, it was dealing with, well, not just sin, but guilt. So here we have the living bird dipped in blood dealing with sin or the... Uh, the, the, the pointer towards sin from leprosy, and then we have guilt as typified in the scapegoat, and of course we have mental death as typified in the ashes of the red heifer. Come back to me. All taught in the Old Testament, and they actually happen, not just allegories, not just little stories, they actually happen. They had a significance back there. But God, in teaching the people to shed the blood of these animals, was also go only giving a lesson to what would happen when His Son came along. And then it wouldn't only be the purging of leprosy, for example. It would be the purging of a dead conscience, a conscience that was manipulated by the devil through wrong religious upbringing. How many people just cannot enjoy God because of religious garbage. I'm going to go back uh, to one thing I said about my own dearly beloved Ireland. I remember a few years ago, I don't know why, the way it is today, but they actually had preachers parading and picketing outside the town council and the parks and so forth because somebody had the temerity, had the gall to say that they would unlock, unchain, I kid you not, the little swings on the Sunday, the little swings, and let children who were used to being raised in, in bloodshed and death and murder, and, 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 and uh, they wanted to have a little swing with their parents pushing them on a Sunday. And these preachers said, no, it's violating God and God's Word and God's will. That's 100% garbage, not taught in the Bible anywhere, and it's called the traditions of man making void the Word of God, and you keep on teaching children those kind of things, you'll have a rebellious group after a while, or you will have a group who are Pharisees and who will go out and preach bondage to others again. Now, that's a lot in a few minutes. I want us to look carefully and a little slower at the living bird dipped in blood, first of all, then the two goats, and then the red heifer, and see what God did to deal with these three things, sin, guilt, death. Transfer it then to you and I living in these days through our substance Christ, and find out how, how you can be released from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of tormenting guilt, and from mental death that tormenting guilt always brings. No wonder, just before I start into the Old Testament, no wonder the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 2, and well, well, I'll give you verse 1 as well, where he says, There is therefore now no condemnation, katakrima, no eternal condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Now, that's not talking about adultery or murder. That's talking about who walk not after righteous fleshly works, which they think they can do in order to get right with God. 
but they walk after the Spirit. How do you walk after the Spirit? By depending on Calvary and what God did for us through Calvary and recognizing that righteousness before God is an imputed gift, giving in exchange for our faith and trust in what He did on the cross. And then the second verse of Romans chapter 8 tells us, For the law of the Spirit of life, remember those two words, Spirit and life, in Christ Jesus, hath made us free from the law of sin and death. See, there's a law of sin and death in the believer's minds many times until they get set free from it. They either sin, or the devil accuses them, and they feel like they've sinned, and so they feel guilty, and that's like the devil beating death blows on their mind. And then when that happens, they're weaker, so they sin again, so they're guilty again, so they feel weaker again, so they sin again, so they feel guilty again. It ends up they're so tormented they never enjoy God. And they think that it's God beating them and beating them up. And it's not God. It is a cultured conscience out of control by the devil and by false teaching. But the law of the Spirit of life as we pour God's Word into people. The Word takes grip. That brings the Spirit of life. Then when you're filled with the Spirit, you want more of the Word. You get more of the Word. You get more of the Spirit of life. So we have one that's a victory circle. Spirit life, Spirit life, Spirit life, Spirit life, filling your being the victory circle. And it takes over from the vicious circle, the law of sin and death, sin and death, which is your mind filled with. Spirit and life, or sin and death. It all comes from a twisted conscience. Now here's what we're told in Leviticus chapter 14. I'm reading at the moment, I hope you have your Bible, I'm reading from the living Bible. Who? He believes in reading the living Bible. Listen, God's not afraid of truth. He's not afraid of scholarship and study. Find out all you can about God by consulting uh, different translations. You don't have to uh, be sold on every last thing that somebody says, but you can learn. It so happens that this particular Leviticus 14 is extremely clear uh, uh, relating to uh, the teaching of the living bird and the dead bird, and it bears out the point. Before I read it, and I think I'm going to ask this camera to pick it up in a moment. Before I read it, let me tell you the quick story. It's when a leprous man, by the way, the lepers had been banned way outside the camp, in quarantine, but if his leprosy started to disappear, he was to go and show himself to the priest, and only if there was evidence it was disappearing, the priest would uh, uh, say yes if that was the case, and then there had to be a ceremonial cleansing, and that's where the two birds come in. You remember when Jesus met the ten lepers, and he said, go show yourselves to the priest. Well, that's what he was saying. Go show yourself to the priest so that you can have ceremonial cleansing. Of course, those men had to take steps of faith. For when Jesus said that, they still had leprosy, evidently, but they were healed as they went. That's a powerful story of faith. But on the ceremonial cleansing bit, that's what Jesus was telling them to do. Uh, let me read just seven verses, if we can close in here. Can we get this? Let me set this other Bible down for a moment. I've got Bibles all over the place. Let's see if we can pick this up here. Can we get it here? Let me put it this way, a little easier maybe. Here it is, I think. And the Lord gave Moses these regulations concerning the person whose leprosy disappears. The priest shall go out of the camp to examine him. If the priest sees that the leprosy is gone, now remember we're talking about conscience, but we're getting the type and shadow. He shall require two living birds of a kind permitted for food, and shall take, now get these three things, he shall take some cedar wood, uh, keep it in a little closer, a scarlet string, and some hyssop, hyssop branches. Hyssop. You remember David in Psalm 51 said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. We'll come back on that. It has a significance. So you take two living birds, and you also take cedar wood, scarlet, string, some hyssop branches to be used for the purification ceremony of the one who is healed from leprosy, which is a typification of us being delivered from sin. The priest shall then order one of the birds killed in an earthenware pot held over, that should, held over running water. The other bird 
still living shall be dipped in the blood along with the cedar wood, the scarlet thread. Come back to me. In fact, I'll just read this last bit. It's verse 7. Uh, and the hyssop branch, verse 7. Then the priest, now get this, the priest shall sprinkle the blood seven times upon the man cured of his leprosy, and the priest shall pronounce him cured, and shall let the living bird fly into the open field. Now what in the world is that all about? Well, Paul, especially in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, he takes these happenings, applies them to us spiritually because of Calvary, and tells how we can be sprinkled with blood, not exactly blood, but in our spirits, so that we can be what? Purged from a dead conscience, so that we can be sprinkled, so that we can not only be cleansed in our hearts, but our minds can be loosed, and we can begin to enjoy what God has done in our hearts. No wonder it says, not only get sprinkled in your spirit, but purged and sprinkled also in your conscience. But back to this brief story here. A man has leprosy, he's quarantined, he may die out there in quarantine. But if he believes that it's disappearing, he comes back there to the priest, the priest examines it. If he says it's true, there has to be a ceremonial cleansing because leprosy speaks of sin which separates from God. Therefore, there has to be a cleansing. And a strange thing happened at that point. They took two birds, and one was killed, the other one was not. Both represent Jesus Christ and what He does for us on our hearts and our conscience. They take the two birds, they kill one, and they kill it and mix it with the blood with the running water. And they put into the mixture some cedar wood, some hyssop, and some scarlet thread, now, or, or a string. Now, now, what do those things stand for to put in with the blood and the water? Well, the cedar, of course, speaks of fragrance, endurance, and almightiness. You've heard of the cedars of Lebanon. Hyssop in biblical lands to this day is as frequently found as grass in our countries. And it just speaks of that which you apply it with, the abundance of grace, the abundance of faith, the freedom, the freely given blessing of God to deliver your mind, your conscience, and of course your spirit. And then nobody knows, nobody needs to know or to be told what the scarlet thread which bind those things together speaks of. It always speaks of redemption, like Rahab and the scarlet thread of deliverance. So here is the dead bird after it's been killed. Water washes over it. Water, therefore, is mixed with the blood. There's put into that mixture uh, some cedar wood, speaking of endurance and dignity and mightiness and fragrance. Uh, applied uh, also with the, uh, the much available hyssop, and of course, all tied together with redemption, which speaks of, uh, uh, we, we get that from the scarlet thread. When all that's happened, then the leprous man watches with such delight as that mixture is then applied to the living bird taken outside the camp, and the leprous man watches as the living bird flies away and disappears completely into the distance. It's gone. Now, what is that all about? Well, it's leprosy, but it speaks of sin. It speaks of separation from God. It speaks of a heart that's full of sin or a mind that's full of fear and guilt, and transfer it all to the New Testament in Christ, and the Bible says we have to get it sprinkled on us when we accept it by faith. Because the high priest, he took of this mixture, sprinkled it on the man seven times, which speaks of complete deliverance, and he watched the bird fly away. And as he watched it, he was so happy because he said, not only there in representation form, there goes my leprosy, but he said, there goes my dirtiness, there goes my uncleanliness, there goes my separation from God, I'm reunited one more time. What a beautiful illustration. And both birds represent Christ, the Christ who dies for us and sheds His blood, but also the Christ who takes our guilt, our sin, our death, whatever, and causes it to be taken far away so that it flies away, and the man never saw that bird again and it was dipped in the blood of the living bird. Now, it took two birds to make the illustration of the death and the life.
But in Christ, we just need one Jesus, of course, and He gives the illustration and is the fulfiller and the substance for both. But wait a minute. Before we even get to the two goats and to the red heifer, and we'll do as much as time allows, there's something powerful that I want you to get. In all three instances, the bird, the goats, the red heifer, you can read it yourself. It all had to happen outside the camp. This was back when they were in the wilderness and they had camp set up, but it had to take place outside the camp. Now, it does tell us over in the book of Hebrews, we'll come to that a bit later, chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, just as these animals were killed outside the camp, so Christ Himself, when Jesus died in Calvary to fulfill these things, do you know that Jesus also died outside the city wall? In fact, there's a little old song. It's a hymn from many years ago. There is a green hill far away outside the city wall. Why? Why did that happen? Not only in the Old Testament, but in the fulfillment. Christ did not die within Jerusalem. He died outside it because, as I've said, it said in Hebrews 13, 11 and 12, just as that happened to the animals, so Christ, the fulfiller and the substance, he died outside that city wall, outside the gate, in fact, it says. Why? You've got to hear why. Because Jerusalem, no matter how much our Lord loved Jerusalem, it spoke of the law, the Levitical law, the types and shadows. It spoke of man's effort. It spoke of ecclesiasticalism. It spoke of mere human ceremony, and it was confined by a wall. In other words, the law was insufficient to do it. Only in type and shadow can we get blessing from it. But no man is saved by the law or by attempting the works of righteousness. Paul said, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Even though most preachers today lay the and dump on people, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other thing. To get a miracle, send me money, or read three chapters today, or pray for two hours a day. Now, reading and praying is good, but not if it's because somebody lays a guilt trip on you. Then you, you do it for all the wrong reasons. So that old religious system won't work. And Jerusalem represents man's attempt through the law to get right with God. Jesus died outside. No wonder the prophet Zechariah talked about Jerusalem being a city without walls. Because Jesus died outside the wall to show what? Number one, the law couldn't do it. Number two, it would have to be done outside the law, in grace, for the whole world, for the bird flew away, and it was not to be confined by the Jewish law, but without walls, grace for the whole world. So when the Bible says Jesus died outside, that's why. Because Jerusalem represented the law which produces a bad conscience which many people seem to want to keep, as did James and some others in the New Testament, even when they got saved. Some of the Judaizers said, well, Paul's right. You're saved by the blood as long as you add on, you know, circumcision and uh, add on the, the Jewish law. No. Paul said, I'll die for it. These are perverts. Paul said, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, having a liberated conscience so that you can start to enjoy in your head what Christ has performed in your heart when you accepted Him by faith. This is the tragedy today because of guilt-ridden preachers dumping upon people. Boy, if you could only come to believers and cut their heads off, I mean, things would be a lot better, and yet I suppose that would cause its own problems. But you know what I mean. If you could bypass the head and get to the heart, they could enjoy their salvation. They enjoy it here, but it gets ruined here because this is tuned into the law-giving preachers today who mess up the people's conscience. No wonder it says, get your conscience sprinkled like the man sprinkled the leprous man. Is it possible for us to put that back up again, that uh, graphic there, so that we can see it one more time? We have covered a good bit, and we're going fast, but I mean, fasten your seatbelt, and let's keep going here. And after a bit, Ruth Ann will sing again. A number will come up, and you can call it and get my notes on this. 
abbreviated notes, let me tell you, but ne notes nevertheless. The living bird dipped in blood. He flew away. The reason why his leprosy disappeared was because of the blood. The scapegoat, which was two goats, one being a scapegoat and the other one was killed, and the red heifer. All right, come back to me. Leviticus uh, chapter 16, verses uh, 7 and 10. Let me get it here. 7 through 10, I should say. Can you come in here on this? Uh, uh, Leviticus 16. Uh, then he shall bring the two goats. If our camera, we got it. Uh, I read the other bit down here. The camera doesn't need to pick that up. But Leviticus uh, chapter 16 starts with verse 7. This is to do with the day of atonement, once a year for the children of Israel. The high priest went in there to get the guilt removed for the year from the children of Israel. He took not one goat, but two goats before the Lord. Notice that. It takes two to represent the one Christ, because this is just in type and shadow. This has to do with guilt, just like the, the birds had to do with sin took two goats before the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle and cast lots to determine which is the Lord's, which gets uh, killed, which is to be sent away. Now, uh, the goat allotted to the Lord shall, be shall then be sacrificed by Aaron as a sin offering. The other goat shall be kept alive and placed before the Lord. The rite of atonement shall be performed over it, and it shall then be sent out into the desert as a scapegoat. Now, I'm coming on down here. Maybe our camera can get back in here, can you? To verse 15, if you can. It's right over here where my thumb is. I'm jumping forward because of the sake of time. You can read the whole chapter of Leviticus 16. Here it is. Then he must go out and sacrifice the people's sin offering goat and bring its blood within the veil. Remember, he must go out. But he'll bring the blood within the veil and sprinkle it upon the place of mercy and in front of it just as he did with the blood of the young goat. Now on down to verse 20, which is, let me get it here. This takes a moment for the camera, but it's good to do it. Verses 20, and then I'm through 20 to 22 through this part. When he has completed the rite of atonement for the holy place, the entire tabernacle and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. The, the, the other one's already been killed and laying both hands upon its head, confess over it the sins or the guilt of the people of Israel. He shall lay all their sins upon the head of the goat and send it into the desert, led by a fit man. It says in the regular King James, led by a fit man appointed for the task. Yeah, you can come back to me. We've talked about sin. Now, it's one thing to sin. It's another thing to keep the guilt of sin even after the sin has been forgiven. That's a favorite trick of the devil. You must understand that God breaks the power of cancel sin, as Charles Wesley put it in his song. He breaks the power of cancel sin. In other words, he just doesn't cancel the sin, forgive it, but he breaks the power so no longer does either the sin or the guilt of the sin have any rule over us. But how many believers have guilt even over sins long since forgiven. I remember a man in Ireland coming to visit me from a town about 30 miles from Belfast called Portadown, and you watching in Ireland would recognize that name. And he said he'd been a Christian for over 40 years, but he never had peace. He was tormented by a sin, one single sin, which he had committed 40 years ago, and he felt guilty to this day. He was raised in a ministry of dumping of guilt. And most preachers are guilty of that sin. Now, today in America, it's not so much that. Well, you still get a good bit of that. But nowadays it is, you know, send me $50 or you're not going to be healed or your children won't be saved, at least by implication. That also is a form of guilt. Or you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other thing. And they tell you all the nice things you got to do, especially you got to go out and witness for Jesus. Let me tell you, friends, good to witness as God gives you the opportunity, but you're a witness, not just when you open your mouth, just you. And we have had this thing so twisted that there's some people think they're not saved unless they can hijack somebody into the kingdom before sundown. What a tragedy. This is dealing with guilt. The Day of Atonement, the Old Testament. The priest takes 
two goats. One is slain. The other one is taken outside the camp by a fit man. And he takes him far, far, far away and leads him into the wilderness until finally he disappears. Now, as the years rolled by, the Jews actually added something to that. And the fit man or the appointed man actually took the goat to the top of a rocky cliff and pushed him over to make sure he never returned. The Bible doesn't go that far, but he took him away until it disappeared. Both goats represent Christ. Christ died for us and for our guilt, but he also represented in the uh, second goat, make sure that he, the fit man, removes our sins so that they're gone into a place, the Bible says, not inhabited, a solitary place, and they're gone, and they're gone forever. So I want you to know that you can be sprinkled with this. You can have this applied to you so that you say, no longer am I going to be cursed with a mind and a conscience which is still in tune with the rules and regulations of today's lawgivers, but I'm going to enjoy in my mind the peace that he put in my heart because I've been sprinkled with the blood and the one goat died, the other one took away my guilt, it's forever, and both represent the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you and who personally has removed your guilt beyond recall because it went to the place where nobody could ever bring that second goat back again. Sins forgiven, guilt removed. Sprinkled. I sprinkle you with this. I sprinkle you through my ministry to liberate your conscience and to liberate it particularly from the stupid lawgivers today who add to the blood. And let me tell you, when you add to Calvary, you just took away from Calvary. When you add to the blood, you just took away from the blood. You're saved by grace plus nothing. God deliver us from preachers. How am I so calm here? God deliver us from preachers who have done more damage to more people than all the bartenders in town put together by a wrong dumping of guilt upon people. Now let me go over to the next one. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to read some from Numbers uh, chapter 19. If we can get it here, read verses 1 through 6. And this has to do with the ashes of the red heifer. Then I'm going to break, allow Ruthann to sing another time, give you a chance to get to the phone, and then I'll come back and summarize the whole thing. And you can still call after the program's off the air or after you uh, have watched the video or whatever it is. Can you pick this one up also, please? Right here, let me get it this way. Chapter 19, this is Numbers now. We've moved to the book of Numbers. Have you got it here? Down at the bottom here where my thumb is. Right, you do. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Here is another of my laws. This is Old Testament. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without... I'm going to ask the camera while I'm changing it. Can they come back in if they can? Uh, without defect, it says, as the camera picks it up. One that has never been yoked. Give her to Eleazar the priest, and he shall take her outside the camp outside the camp, and someone shall kill her as he watches. Eliezer shall take some of her blood and upon his finger and sprinkle it, sprinkle it seven times completion towards the front of the tabernacle. Then someone shall burn the heifer as he watches the whole thing, her hide, meat, blood, and dung. And Eliezer shall take, hey, we got the same three things, cedar wood, hyssop branches, and scarlet thread, and throw them into the burning pile. Come back to me. Now, I'll talk to you about the red heifer uh, when we get back. It speaks of deliverance from death or the ceremonial death. I'll explain it when we get back in a moment or two. I need you. I need you every hour. Isn't that what we can all say toward the Lord? We need Him. Not the foolishness of so much preaching that goes on today, manipulative preaching, but the pure Word of God is what we need. All right, let's take a break. It says here, anyone who touches, by the way, this is the same chapter, Numbers 19, anyone who touches a dead human body shall be defiled for seven days and must purify himself the third and the seventh days. Third speaks to us of the resurrection day. Seventh always speaks of completion. 
He must purify himself the third and the seventh days with water run through the ashes of the red heifer. Then he will be purified. But if he does not do this on the third day, he will continue to be defiled even after the seventh day. It's through the resurrection. If we try to get it some other way, it won't work. Anyone who touches a dead person and does not purify himself in the manner specified has defiled the tabernacle of the Lord and shall be excommunicated from Israel. The cleansing water was not sprinkled upon him, so the defilement continues. You can come back to me here. There's some, uh, let me just see some things here. You know, I'm almost out of time. We talked about the living bird. It deals with the removal of our sin, the goat taking away our guilt. Those two things, if you don't get rid of them in your mind, even after you've accepted Christ, if you've been listening to dumpy preachers preaching on you and messing with your mind and producing a false conscience, then you're going to have death in the mind. That law of sin and death I talked about. You'll be saved. You'll go to heaven. But you'll be miserable on the way there, and you'll make most people around you. For about 50 miles, they'll be miserable too. You need to live a while. You need to rejoice in freedom and liberty. No wonder Paul said in Galatians, Who hath bewitched you? Who hath tricked you into the bondages of the law? Well, this speaks, the red heifer speaks of the culmination of the other two things, that is, sin and guilt to death. Now, this was physical death they talked about, but to us, we're talking about death in our relationship with God. Even though a person can say, I'm still saved, but they're not enjoying the Lord. That's why you need your conscience sprinkled, as I've been trying to teach you today. Now, what happened to the red heifer? Well, it was to be a red heifer. Even they said if two follicles of hair were a different shade, it was no good. It had to be red. You know what red stands for. It was very, very special. It must never be yoked to anything else. Christ and Christ alone died for us. That's what His work and job is. Blessed be His wonderful name. He died solely and totally for us and for sin and for sinners, as you well know. And what happened to this red heifer? He was taken outside the camp. He was slain. He dies. The whole thing is burnt. The Bible says right down from his hide to his dung. The whole thing is burnt, like a burnt offering to the Lord. Then something strange happened. The ashes were taken, mixed with water, and in goes, yes, we got it again, the cedar wood, Speaks of strength and power and so forth. In fact, the cedar wood went in before it was mixed with the water when it was being burned. And the hyssop, speaking of the, uh, the abundance of the freedom of receiving it, how, how generous God is. And of course, the scarlet, speaking of redemption. When all that was taken and then mixed with the water, then what they had to do was take it and sprinkle it on, not only a person, but on furniture or anything, that had been close to a dead body, a corpse. Not a day we don't have to do this. These are types and shadows. But it spoke of death or separation from God. And in order to get those people cleansed because they had either touched a corpse, literally a corpse, or come close to it, the priest would have to sprinkle this mixture off the ashes of the red heifer and the, uh, and the water, and of course those other things, the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet thread I've talked to you about, so that the people were then proclaimed alive again. They were alive, all right, but alive in their relationship because they had been cleansed from the ceremonial death that was brought about by them being touching a corpse or being close to a corpse, or even they had to sprinkle furniture or a bed or anything, a utensil that had been close to or touched or came in contact with a corpse and or somebody had brushed up against it and so forth. You got the picture. What does this speak to us of? Well, it says, of course, so clearly that we have to have in the New Testament a conscience which is sprinkled. Because if we allow sin and, and, and guilt to torture us, it will bring mental, spiritual death. But we are to be purged from those things so that death does not reign in our mind or in our spirits, 
so that we become alive unto God, alive unto joy, alive unto the blessing of God, alive unto doing the work of God, but not under a load of guilt all the time. Did you get that? Now, I don't know how much time, well, I guess I've just got very little time. Let me kind of turn as fast as I can here, way over to the book of Hebrews. It says, i uh, probably not got time to pick it up on the camera, but it says uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, only got a couple of minutes to go. Let me see if I can get this in. Hebrews 13, 11 and 12. For the bodies of these beasts, talking about the Old Testament, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, were burned outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might save the people with his blood, suffered outside the gate. So your deliverance is getting delivered from the guilty death blows coming to your mind because of a conscience that was manipulated by the guilt-dumping preachers or Sunday school teachers or whoever got to you. Jesus died outside showing you can't have peace by the law. You can only have peace by grace because you accept what Jesus did for you and it not only forgives you and gets you right for heaven, but it strengthens you so that you're right here for this earth as well. A couple of other scriptures, and one of these seconds, they're going to count me down so fast. I'm going to have to be out of here and watch for important announcements. And you people overseas, you'll get an address and a telephone number. You can get the notes of this thing coming up in just a moment. Let me give you perhaps just one reading. It says here in Hebrews 9, verse 13, I'll just read it to you. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling thee unclean, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. Back there. How much more through the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself on without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works so that you can serve the living God. Blessed be his glorious name. What is this all about? Well, you know it's a curtailed message because of the confines of television time. But you can call when we're off the air uh, for the notes or that number or write to that address or whatever and be free from a conscience that is bound by religiosity. Be free, be free, be free. And I'll see you next week. Amen.